My name is Mark Angelucci. I'm an attorney and I also teach family law at Pasadena City College and I'm vice president of the National Coalition for Men. The National Coalition for Men was founded in 1977 in Maryland by a group of men who were originally involved in feminist men's groups, but they branched out from it because they didn't agree, even though they agreed that gender roles were too restrictive, they didn't agree with the rhetoric and the anti-male mentality that a lot of the feminist men had. They, did, they believed that both men and women had uh, faced discrimination in different ways and they, they, that men's issues needed to be addressed too in terms of institutional discrimination, in terms of pressure on them as men and, and in other ways. So they started a group called Free Men. The term free men was, was meant as a verb. The word free was, free was meant to be a verb uh, to, in terms of freeing men from different types of discrimination or pressures. Um, eventually it evolved into the Coalition of Free Men and then it evolved into National Coalition of Free Men. Um, about, I'd say maybe six years ago, the new president, Harry Crouch, uh, had it changed with the approval from the board to National Coalition for Men for various reasons. But we're corporate, it's still, the corporate name is still National Coalition of Free Men. And we address pretty much all the, all the men's issues historically that, that, that Warren Farrell does in the myth of male power. We, we have dealt, and we're very, uh, we're membership based, and so our, and all volunteers, and so our activism is very chapter based. We have chapters all over the U.S. We have uh, members all over the U.S. and in every continent. And the chapters do what they want. Um, so, I mean, it, of course, they can't go outside of our perspectives, but they, they do all kinds of different things. Some of them focus on tabling. Others focus on media. Some of them do protests. Um, and I founded the Los Angeles chapter in the year 2000, and I was president for 10 years, and we were very active. We did a lot of things, including lawsuits that changed laws in the area of domestic violence uh, and legislative advocacy for, pat for attorney fraud victims. We've, we've done all, all kinds of street rallies. Uh, we, we, the things that we did, we, we got so much media. Um, we spoke at universities. We, we took part in film screenings. There were so many things I can't even list it all and mm -hmm. provided a lot of moral support for a lot of men who were uh, going through very difficult situations. Okay. So you were a lawyer too. So uh, which one have you been doing longer? Uh, and then how did you like come to find the other? If that makes any sense. Yeah, I, well, while I was a law student at, at UCLA Law, I had a, a good friend who was being physically abused by his wife whenever she's drunk. And they both drink a lot, but he's a happy drunk and she's occasionally a very violent drunk, and I've seen it. Um, and I, and he, would, he would call me all the time while I'm a law student, and it was getting really difficult for me. And he needed help, but especially his kids. They had three minor kids. So I one time said, look, I'm gonna try and find you something where you can take these kids and get out of there. You know, I have, I, I don't have time to go picking them up and all that, so I called all the hotlines and everywhere, and I learned that there was only one place that would take a male victim. Some of these places didn't even tell me that, uh, but I eventually learned there is one way out in Lancaster, which is a, a, a desert community about an, an hour or more north, still in LA County, but way out in the desert. Um, and so by the time I even learned that, it was too late. He was, you know, it was late in the night or maybe even the next morning. Um, but I became really curious about that. Why is that happening? And I had read about that somewhere once, years before when I was a, a, a student at UC Berkeley. And so now it be, I became interested in it again. And um, I, I called Valley Oasis. I started calling, looking things up online, researching the whole thing. And ultimately I found there's the, the, the former director of Valley Oasis, that's what it's called, that shelter in Lancaster, um, was a woman named Patricia Overberg. And she was like an LA version of Erin Pizzi. Um, she was the director there in the 80s and men were coming from all over who needed help, male victims. Uh, and she decided, okay, we have 13 houses. They're all kind of in the same lot. We're gonna set aside one of them for male victims. 
and she told her staff and she changed everything, but as a result, she was ostracized and mistreated and abused by the other shelter directors. Very much like Erin Pizzi. She wasn't driven out of her country. She was a very tough woman and she stood with it. She would go to the conferences and the meetings but when she spoke out about the need to help male victims, they would refuse to put her comments in the minutes and things like that. She was subjected to all kinds of abuse. She had to make a complaint with the county supervisors. Um, so she told me on the phone, we need a lawsuit. You need to, you need to file a lawsuit. She was no longer the director. It was a new person who carried on her policy. Um, but she told me, we need a civil rights lawsuit. And that, I, I always remembered that. So eventually I researched, I found, I joined the National Coalition of, at that time called A Free Man. I liked it, they gave me, I started publishing um, articles in the Daily Bruin at UCLA and the law school newspaper about these issues. I read Warren Farrell. Uh, I started publishing not just on domestic violence, but all kinds of things. That's when I met Glenn Sachs. At the time he was, uh, he was a student there and he was publishing articles too. And we would back each other up uh, in the newspaper. If you remember him, he's not active anymore, but for years he was very known as a, a freelance journalist who wrote on men's rights issues. Um, when I graduated, I started the Los Angeles chapter of NCFM. And uh, gosh, we, we did so many things I can't even list it all. but. The one thing that I think I guess I'm most proud of and that I'll think about in my deathbed was um, the lawsuit called Woods versus Horton, where we took four male victims uh, throughout California. One of them was in a wheelchair. Uh, one of them was, uh, one of them had mental disabilities and actually committed suicide while the case was pending. Uh, another one was David Woods, the main plaintiff who was a really tough ex-bouncer. And his, but it, he never, he, he knew he could kill his wife if he hit her. And she was always, whenever she was mad, she would slap him around. She admitted it. She knew she had a problem. Um, and all of them had been denied services when they sought services because they're men. So we sued one of the shelters in Sacramento and the state of California. And it's a very long story how we did it. I'll talk more about it tomorrow, but we've sued under the state Equal Protection Clause of the state of the the, U, the state constitution, not the U.S. Constitution. There are strategic reasons why, um, and it was years and years of of a battle. At the lower court, we lost, but ultimately, on appeal, we won. It was overturned. All three judges agreed with us, said this is unconstitutional. It's discriminatory. Um, the language could have been stronger, but it was very good, and. It was a landmark ruling, and we got media all over the place, uh, all the way to Scotland, covering it. And it's not over because uh, the implementation of it is still something we need a lot of work on. You know, it made it a big impact. We know that the shelter that we sued, we reached a settlement with them, um, and I can't. It's a, it's a confidential settlement, but I can tell you that that shelter made a lot of major, major changes. They made their they're title, gender neutral, and they, this was a shelter that got $4 million a year. Half of it state funds, half of it private. Uh, they created a battered men's uh, program. They, did, uh, they retrained their staff with one of our experts. It was amazing what they did. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not the end of it. There's still a lot to do, and we're still working on that. And I believe another lawsuit's needed. Uh, and it's in the works, but it's going to take a little bit. And I, do, I had to do all this pro bono because my, I had to work regu a regular job. I was working different jobs. I started in a nonprofit place helping people with mental disabilities for free. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to other places. I always had to do this work nights and weekends. Um, we also changed the paternity laws. We found a, a st we had so many men coming to us who were victims of paternity fraud, who were forced had these court orders where they had to pay child support for a child, in some cases they'd never even met, uh, in all, each case where they had DNA proving the child's not theirs. And the judge is saying, even, even the sympathetic judges would say, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about this. Yeah. You, you, you took more than this six month period that you had to challenge it, and there's nothing I can do. Um, so we had to change the law somehow. And we found a state legislator 
who was interested, and it's because he represented South Central, the black community. Yeah. And he was a black Democrat, and he had lots of men in that area who were fraternity fraud victims. So we worked together with them, including fathers' rights group, groups in the black community. Um, and we uh, raised as much money as we could. We would drive people up to Sacramento to testify. We got a bill introduced. It was a, like a three-year battle. Uh, feminist groups like California Now and others appeared and fought and gutted it and, and fought and fought. But ultimately... The, well, I'm sorry. What was the... Uh, you mentioned that you worked with people like the, in the South Central area, right? And mm -hmm. I was just thinking, when it comes to uh, paternity fraud and wrongful paternity and stuff, is that... Does this sort of transcend things like economic status and race and all that? Or do you see, like, patterns within, you know, like, say, lower income areas? Maybe it's more frequent there or what have you yeah. in your experience? Well, I couldn't tell you statistically because I haven't seen actual research. So I'm, I'm cautious about making a judgment on that. Sure. But the impact that I saw was much stronger in the black community than in others because a lot of them couldn't hire attorneys. I mean, we had these guys, many of them in South Central, but also like Taron, Taron James, the Navy guy, was a white guy. He just didn't have much money. He just got out of the Navy. He, he earned minimum wage. So people like that, they can't go, they can't put up a $5,000 retainer for an attorney. They either represent themselves or someone helps them pro bono. Yeah. And um, that's what I did for some of them. But, uh, but as far as what you're asking me, I think there is a difference in that they have, in the black community in particular, there's a, there's a difficulty of hiring an attor attorneys. Um, and there's also a, a stereotype. I mean, I don't know, I mean, I even remember racial jokes long ago before we had, we were using DNA about black men saying, always saying it ain't my baby. Mm -hmm. And now I look back and think, wow, if, if 30% of, of, of DNA paternity tests from accredited labs are coming out negative, and we have those that, I can show that. From the accredited labs, 30% come out negative. If that's the case, how many of these black men were falsely stereotyped, but they had no way to prove it wasn't their child? They were just insisting on it. And who, you know, they weren't believed because of the stereotypes and the jokes. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think about that. But as far as the difference statistically, I don't know. I mean, yeah. there are wealthy ones too. Kirk Kerkorian, who owns the Kerkorian Theaters, he had some kind of paternity fraud thing going on too. And we contacted, I contacted his attorney and told him what we're doing and said, look, if you could drop a little money, we could really make a bigger difference in changing these laws. We have to get these people up to Sacramento to testify and all that. His attorney, about a week later, called back and said that his client's not interested. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, you know, sometimes it's annoying when you see people like this who have money who could help with just a little drop in the, in the bucket and don't. That's frustrating. Yeah. You know, right. when, when the others are, are fighting so hard and, and, and using our volunteer time and donating, you know, to make mm -hmm. these changes. So, but so uh, you said you had it to uh, sort of, you know, take a bit of a step back out of this uh, because you were giving up so much of your time, you know, working pro bono to help these guys and it was just getting to the point where, you know, it just wasn't manageable. Um, but now, but you still obviously do care a lot about these issues. I mean, you're still involved with NCFM and you're still, I mean, you came to the ICMI. So um, I guess what I would ask is since your time of your involvement from the beginning to all the things you've been through to now, uh, how have you seen like a, a, a growth or a big change in the men's movement? Oh, it's phenomenal! I, it is absolutely amazing. It's one of the reasons I come to this. It's it's just so inspiring to me to see all those years, and there were many before me. I mean, I don't like to pretend. You know, there were many before me. It went all the way back to the 70s and earlier. Mm -hmm. And some of these people I still know, like Fred Hayward in the, in the film. He goes way, way back. Um, and just, yeah, I remember when I first was on the internet and there was so little going on. NCFM had done some things and there were other small groups all over. But, but compared to now, it's unbelievable. 
Back then, if you said fathers' rights groups, people would sort of laugh at it or say, oh, those are the ones who don't want to pay child support. Today, that's changed. If you say fathers' rights, people kind of get it, you know? Yeah. And I think men's rights will evolve that same way, but it's just going to take a lot, well, it's going to take more time. Um, but I think, I think it is evolving that way, and it, it, I mean, it's unreal what I'm seeing. Men's rights activists have now gotten international human rights courts, courts to address father's rights, both the United Nations and the European Union. Um, and I'll, I might mention this that tomorrow, but the MRAs in Israel got the United Nations Human Rights Court to chastise Israel for uh, its tender years doctrine. That they didn't have binding authority, but they chastised Israel for it. Uh, and, then the, and then the European Union, men, MRAs in Germany, where men were being, uh, men who were unmarried, were being denied any custody unless mom consented. Well, the MRAs there got the e European Union Human Rights Court to stop, to put a stop to that. Mm -hmm. So people can say MRAs aren't doing anything. They're absolutely wrong. The international, they've gotten international human rights courts to address these things. And I think we need to do that more. But it has to be done right or you could set bad precedent, you know. Um, hmm. I think ultimately I would love to do that myself. I would love to do that because appeals are what I love most. Challenging judges' decisions are something I just love. Uh, when I, when, out yeah, when I overturn a judge's decision, I celebrate for a month. I just, uh, <laughs> it's just, it just feels really good, especially yeah. if it's something I really, really believe in. You know? Yeah. When was the last time that you did do that? Um, I did that a few, about four months ago, in a workers' compensation matter, which was not really men's rights. So, sure. so I might have celebrated two weeks instead of a month. But, <laughs> um, but, but uh, before that, it was the Woods. No, no, I had another one after Woods versus Horton, but it was a smaller issue. It wasn't really. It, it was not so much a civil rights issue. It was just a technical change to the law that the judges were doing incorrectly. Um, but still, it felt really good. A Woods versus Horton, I probably celebrated for four or five months. I mean, <laughs> it was my baby. I mean, I remember, and I won't go on, but I remember when we were it was pending in the appellate court, and my opening brief was coming up due, and I had, I had just begun a draft, and I had to fly somewhere, and I knew that if if that plane shakes, I'm gonna be scared that this case won't if if it crashes. I won't be able, nobody won't carry the case. So I called my friend, I said, look, my an attorney who, who liked what I was doing, and I said, look, if, if anything happens to me, I've drafted a basic skeletal brief that will work. It doesn't have all the stuff I'm gonna eventually put, which, you know, but it will still work. And if, if something happens to me, it'll help me so much to know just when there's turbulence that you'll file this if something happens to me. Yeah. You don't have to do anything else, just file it. And he said, sure. And that gave me peace of mind. It sounds crazy, but that was, that case, it had to happen. It, it had to happen. Um, we have a case pending right now in the federal courts challenging the discrimination in the selective service. Um, and um, it was initially thrown out and at the lower court, and we appealed it and got it, that, uh, that dismissal reversed. So it's revived, but it was transferred to Texas. It's technical reasons why. Uh, we're asking the courts to transfer it back, and we're waiting for the, their order now. And unfortunately, in federal courts, things really work slowly, unless it's a criminal case, which have priority. And what's the specific name of selected service that you're uh, asking? To, is it just to include women? It, we're, well, we're asking to end the discrimination. We're not taking a position as to whether to get rid of the draft or force women to register, just end the discrimination, whichever way. And the appellate courts uh, have, have the, the appellate court that reversed the lower one, all three of them, the decision kind of indicates that they kind of agree with us. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't flat out say it. They said, look, you threw this out on the grounds of ripeness, and we disagree with you. The, you know, you need to reevaluate this. Um, so we're just waiting now, and it's just tied up in motions. But eventually it's going to be heard 
you know, we take no position on whether, I mean, some of us would differ on whether there should sure. be selective service or not. And also, I always like to point out that, this, that the draft does not have to be about combat. During World War II, if you look at the selective service website, it says that during World War II, they almost drafted women as nurses. And the only reason they didn't was that they had enough volunteer nurses. So um, it's just about the responsibility. If men are, are going to be thrown in jail um, or denied student loans or, or grants, exactly, if they're not uh, registering, so should, so should women. It, either get rid of it or require them both. Mm -hmm. It sends the wrong message. It's a message of male disposability in our opinion.